Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering issues in a maternity. They're gonna be a mixed variety of questions in maternity, and I promise there's more to come. Um, before we even get started, guys, if you haven't done so already, please, do not forget to like and subscribe to this video, to this channel. Make sure you press that red notification button so as soon as a new video is released, you'll be notified. Don't forget, guys, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So guys, before we even get started, let's pray. If you're not into that, just go ahead and fast forward. But those who want the prayer, close your eyes, bow your heads. Father God, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for watching over. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity that you provided for us um, to go over these questions and for it to be explained. Father God, I pray over every viewer right now, Lord, please help them, whatever they're struggling with, whether it's priority and delegation, whether it's with content, uh, anything that they're struggling with, Father God, please help them, help them to understand the content, help them to be able to answer these questions accordingly, Father God, for those students that just want to give up, that they don't even have the motivation to study anymore. Father God, I pray that you give them a burst of energy, Father God, and help them want to do this, Lord, Allow them to be encouraged. Uh, Lord, I tell you, thank you for their support system. Those people who are helping them through this program or helping them through studying, trying to pass their boards. I pray for every single one of them. Lord, I ask that you please help me to deliver this information in a way that they can understand, that they can retain, Lord. Thank you for all you've done and all you'll continue to do in our lives. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. Oh, I'm not even on my first question. Hold on, guys. Oh, by the way, as you guys can see, I just got my eyebrows reshaded. So can you believe this? Another two weeks of no makeup. And you guys know how much I love my makeup. I don't know what I'm going to do. Y'all pray for me. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A plan of care is created for a term small for gestational age neonate who is admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit, NICU. The goal was for the newborn to reach five pounds by a specified date. On the specified date, the infant weighs four pounds, two ounces. What should the nurse do next? One, increase the daily number of calories. Two, change the goal to a more realistic number. Three, reassess the problem before altering the plan. Or four, postpone the evaluation date for another month. And guys, the correct answer is to reassess the problem before altering the plan. So remember, guys, in nursing is ad pi. You're going to assess, come up with your nursing diagnosis. You're going to come up with a plan. You're going to intervene. Then you're going to evaluate, did my plan work or not? So if you go back to the question, you will see it says on the specified date, the infant weighed four pounds, two ounces. That's our evaluation. Did our plan work? It did not work because what we wanted was for the patient to gain five pounds and they did not. So what happens after evaluation? Think of ADPI. What comes next? You go back to A, assessment. You ask questions. You get information. You have to reassess because we're starting all over again. That's why number three is the correct answer. Reassess the problem before altering the plan. We have to figure out where we went wrong so the plan is different next time and it actually works. You see choices one and two, increasing the daily number of calories um, and changing the goal to a more realistic number. You cannot do this. It's too early. You can't do this until you reassess, until you get more information. Choice number four, where it says postpone the evaluation date for another month, that's not safe. So you're going to postpone your date just because you didn't get what you wanted? Absolutely not. That's not safe for the patient. We have to figure out where we went wrong, reassess, come up with a new plan, and intervene on that new plan immediately. Okay? So that's why number three is the correct answer. A 17-year-old client who's at 38 weeks gestation is being prepared for an emergency cesarean birth because there's a, there is an abrupt placenta and severe fetal compromise. The client received Nubane 10 milligrams IV 30 minutes ago. Because the client's too sedated to sign the consent form, the nurse should one, call the client's mother and request a verbal consent, two, proceed with preparation for girl written consent, three, have the surgeon and attending practitioner sign consent form, or four, sign the consent form and have the nurse manager countersign the form. 
And guys, the correct answer three, have the surgeon and attending practitioner sign the consent form. So here's why. In a life-threatening situation, legally, the healthcare provider may assume that the patient wanted to live. So you have uh, the providers who's going to be involved in that surgery sign that consent form. We can't waste time trying to call family members to ask them, um, do you consent to this life uh, um preserving measure okay when it comes to something that is life preserving unless that patient stated otherwise illegally you assume that they want to live and so that's why uh number three is the correct answer now let's talk about the wrong answer choices i already talked to you guys about number one you're wasting time getting verbal consent from the mom remember this is a life preserving measure Choice two, proceed with the preparation and forego written consent. You cannot do that. The uh, surgeons, the physicians that are involved in the surgery, they have to sign that consent. Of course, they're going to document. Um, choice four, sign the consent form and the nurse manager countersign the form. No. As the nurse, as the RN, as the LPN, you cannot do that. Your nurse manager cannot do that. It has to be the physicians that the physicians that are actually going to be involved in that surgery. They're the ones who sign the consent form and they also follow up with the documentation of why it was necessary. Okay, guys. So number three is the correct answer. A female client is scheduled for a hysterectomy. When discussing the preoperative preparation, the nurse identifies the client has inadequate understanding of the surgery. What's the next intervention? One, describe the proposed surgery to the client. Two, proceed with implementing the preoperative plan. Three, notify the surgeon that the client needs more information. Or four, explain gently that she should have asked more questions. And guys, the correct answer is three. I am so sorry, but yeah, that that uh, surgeon's gonna have to back it on up. Come back, you have to explain this to the patient because they just don't understand. This is very important, guys, and this is a classic question on NCLEX. They expect you to know this. If a patient has not been informed adequately, it is not your job or responsibility to explain to them um, what's going to happen during the procedure, the risks that can happen during the procedure, the benefits that can happen of the procedure, what can happen if they don't do the, all of that is a physician, is a surgeon. Okay. You as a nurse, you're going to witness that it was informed and signed as a witness, but if they don't understand, I'm so sorry. Absolutely. You have to call them to come back and explain it to the patient. That's why number three is the correct answer. Choice number one, where it says describe the proposed surgery to the client, that is out of your scope of practice. And if you do that and they sign consent, you think that consent was informed? No. Choice two, proceed with implementing the preoperative plan. Uh, criminal charges can be filed against you for that. If that patient go ahead, if you go ahead and have that surgery on that patient and it really was not informed, it wasn't informed consent. What's that? Battery. Battery, guys, when we're speaking in the medical field, is when a patient is touched without their permission. So you don't give adequate, uh, well, not you, but the surgeon hasn't given uh, adequate information for an informed consent. You don't have that informed consent, and you got just you guys just go ahead on with that surgery. Everybody involved um, may be subjected to criminal charges. What are the other choices? Four. Wow. Explain gently that she should have asked more questions. What? Do we ever blame the patient in nursing? Absolutely not. We know that's not the answer choice. So that's why three is the correct answer. A client in labor is being prepared for cesarean birth. What's the most important nursing intervention before anesthesia is ad administered? One, prepare the abdomen. Two, obtain informed consent. Three, initiate an IV infusion. Or four, insert an indwelling urinary catheter. I know you all know this answer. Two, getting that informed consent. Because guys, remember, anesthesia depresses the central nervous system, right? So if that patient got the anesthesia, would that consent really be informed? No, because they were under the influence of a mind-altering substance, which is the anesthesia. So choices one, three, and four don't even matter if that patient was not informed and that informed consent was not signed. That's why number two is the correct answer.
New parents are asked to sign the consent form for their son to be circumcised. They ask the nurse's opinion of the procedure. How should the nurse respond? One, you should talk to your physician about this if you have any questions. Two, let's talk about it because there are advantages and disadvantages. Three, it's a safe procedure and it's best for male infants to be circumcised. Or four, although it may be a somewhat painful experience for the baby, I would allow it if I were you. And guys, the correct answer is two. Let's talk about it because there are advantages and disadvantages. This is a wonderful answer because number one, um, you're creating uh, op an opportunity for the patient to describe their anxiety, their feelings, their concerns. And number two, you're being objective. You're not offering any opinions or being judgmental. Now let's look at the other choices. One, you should talk to your physician about this if you're having any, any questions. Don't ever pass the buck. Whenever you get a test question, if it's something that you are able to do, it's within your scope of practice, you do it. You don't pass the buck to somebody else. And when you tell them, oh, talk to your doctor about it, you're passing the buck when that's absolutely something that's within your scope of practice to discuss and inform them. Okay, so number one's wrong. Three, it's a safe procedure and it's best for male infants. Let's break this down. The first part, it's a safe procedure. There are risks involved. Okay, it's not 100% safe procedure. There are absolutely risks involved. And look at the second part of the statement. It's best for male infants. Best? That's an opinion. We don't ever give our opinions and we're never judgmental when it comes to nursing, when it comes to therapeutic communication. So that's wrong. Choice number four. Although it may be somewhat painful experience for the baby, I would allow it if I were you. First of all, it's not about you. It's about the patient. That's number one. And number two, we do not give our opinions, okay? We have to be factual. We have to be objective. And so that's why number four is the correct answer. That's why number four is the wrong answer. And choice number two is the correct answer. A new mother tells the nurse that her baby spits up after each formula feeding. The nurse teaches her how to position her newborn after feedings. Following the next feeding, the nurse observes that the mother positions the baby correctly. The nurse observed this actively to one, prepare a basic teaching plan, two, validate that learning has occurred, three, ascertain the mother's knowledge base, or four, determine the mother's readiness to learn. And guys, the correct answer is two, validate that learning has occurred. Why? Why is the nurse validating that learning has occurred? Add pie. That's the E part of ADPI evaluation. If learning has not occurred, what is that nurse gonna have to do? Go back to A, assessment, ask questions, get information, then redo teaching. Because that nurse has to figure out what part mom did not understand so she can know what part she has to focus the teaching on the next time around, okay? The parents of a newborn tells the nurse that they do not want their infant's eyes to be treated with a prophylactic agent. How should the nurse respond? One, this is really, excuse me, this is really for the baby's good. Two, this is a legal requirement that must be done. Three, it is best that you discuss this with your pediatrician. Four, you'll have to sign in cons informed consent to refuse the treatment. And the correct answer, guys, is four, you'll have to sign an informed consent to refuse the treatment. Why? This treatment, by the way, guys, we're talking about the erythromycin ointment. This uh, treatment is legally mandated. So for them to refuse it, they're going to have to sign an informed consent. You wanna know what comes with that informed consent? Explaining to them what can possibly happen if that child does not get that erythromycin, they don't get that antibiotic ointment. So they're signing consent that they are aware of what may possibly happen. Why? Remember, guys, this is a legally mandated treatment. So that's why number four is the correct answer. Now, if they had a question that said something like, um, what, are, um, uh, so what are your concerns about this treatment? That would have been your answer. Why? Because you're assessing, you're asking questions. So you'd allow the the parents an opportunity to discuss their fear, their anxiety, their concerns. And you realize while they're talking, maybe there's something that they didn't understand, or maybe they saw something on the internet that's absolutely false. And you can uh, correct those um, 
misplaced ideas that they have, but you wouldn't even know what to correct unless you ask the question. But unfortunately, in these choices, they don't even give you an opportunity to ask questions. These are all statements. So the best out of the four choices we have is number four, letting them know they have to sign a what? Informed consent. That lets us know or lets a test writer know that you understand, number one, this is a legally mandated procedure. And number two, when they sign that informed consent, you will have informed them of why it's important for them to get that ointment, what may possibly happen, okay? So that's why number four is the correct answer. A client at 16 weeks gestation arrives to the prenatal clinic for a routine visit. During the examination, the nurse observes bruises on the client's face and abdomen. There are no bruises on her legs and arms. Further assessment is required to confirm one, domestic abuse, two, hydatiform mole. I cannot, guys, you know I can't speak. Hydatiform mole, three, excessive exercising, or four, thrombocytopenic purpura. And guys, the correct answer is domestic abuse. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, any um, woman who's being abused physically, any type of abuse when there's intimate partner violence, her risk for worsening of the abuse goes up when she's pregnant. And what we find is most of the violence is directed towards what? her abdomen, where the fetus is, because what happens is very often that partner is jealous of this fetus that's growing inside of her. Oh, you're gonna love this baby more than me. Oh, this baby's getting more attention than I am. So we have to be very careful about that. And so we, we're going to suspect uh, domestic abuse. Like I said, the risk for it increases dramatically once mom becomes pregnant. Now let's look at our other choices too, hydatiform mole. With hydatiform mole, we tend to see this, and I put in quotation fetus, is unusually large for the gestational age. The uh, woman be, may be experiencing, you know, nausea and vomiting, hypertension. Those are the signs and symptoms that we would see with hydatiform mole. Excessive um, exercising, that doesn't cause bruising. And choice four, thrombocytopenic purpura. With thrombocytopenic purpura, we would see bruising and petechiae all over the body, not just the face and the abdomen. So guys, that's why number one is the correct answer. Answer. A nurse is teaching a prenatal class about infant safety. After the class, several of the students are heard discussing what they learned. The nurse identifies that the teaching is effective when one of the future parents states, one, my mother's already made the cutest pillowcases for the baby's pillows. Two, I've just bought a new baby seat so that she I just bought a new baby seat that can be strapped onto the front seat of the car. Three, my mother can't believe that babies are supposed to sleep on their backs, not their stomachs. Or four, I was given a baby tub at my shower that has a special safety strap that lets me leave the baby alone in it. And guys, the only correct answer out of these choices is three. My mother can't believe that babies are supposed to sleep on their backs, not their stomachs. So this is the correct answer because it lets us know that the patient knows that the baby's supposed to sleep on their back, but the mom can't believe it. And a way to remember this, guys, is back to sleep. The baby always goes to sleep on their back, and that really decreases the chances of developing SIDS. SIDS, um, sleep-induced what is SIDS? Oh my gosh, what does SIDS stand for? Guys, I'm having a brain fart. SIDS, S-I-D-S. -S. Oh, sleep induced. <laughs> Sudden infant death syndrome. <laughs> All right, so anyway, putting the baby to sleep on their back, it decreases the chance of SIDS, which is sudden, um, sudden inf... I just told you what SIDS stood for and I forgot again. Sleep... Guys, put in the comment section for me. I'm going to be so annoyed. This is going to bother me. 
for the rest of the video, but I have to keep going. <sighs> sudden, sudden infant. All right, put it in the comments. It'll come back to me. I, and I just said it to you, right? All right, I'm crazy today. All right, next question. Sudden infant death syndrome. Sids. All right, next question. Question. A 16-year-old girl at 28 weeks gestation arrives at the prenatal clinic with her mother for a routine sonogram. Before the procedure, the girl requests that the nurse not reveal the fetus's gender if it should become apparent. Afterward, the mother asks the nurse the sex of the fetus. Considering the mother-daughter relationship, the nurse's best response is one, that information is not available at this time. Two, I'm not allowed to divulge confidential information. Three, your daughter asked me not to give that information to anyone. Or four, the sex of the baby isn't the most important information to know at this time. And guys, the correct answer, the most therapeutic answer, the most respectful answer is one, that information is not available at this time. When you say that you're respecting um, the, the, your patient's wishes, and at the same time, you're protecting her relationship with her mother so she's not the bad guy with her mother. Let's look at the other choices. Two, I'm not allowed to divulge informa um, confidential information. What do you think that's going to do? That's just going to make the mother tell the daughter, okay, tell the nurse you're allowed to tell me. And so now you're causing a friction between the mother and daughter. Three, your daughter asked me not. No, absolutely not. Again, you're causing a friction between the mother and daughter. And then four, the sex of the baby is the most important. Um, that's not therapeutic. That's not therapeutic. And um, you're kind of giving your opinion in the situation and it really doesn't help. So the best answer is choice number one. Because of the high discomfort level during the transition phase of labor, nursing care should be directed towards one, helping the client maintain control, two, decreasing the rate of IV fluids, three, administering the prescribed medications, or four, having the client breathe in uniform pattern. And guys, the correct answer is one, helping the client maintain control. So we're talking about the transition phase of labor. This is like the most painful stage of labor, labor. And very often the mom feels like she's losing control. So you want to help her and encourage her and help her feel like she's maintaining control. That is the correct answer. Now let's look, look at the wrong choices. Two, decreasing rate of IV fluid. Guys, in this phase, her m metabolic rate is increase so we're going to increase fluids not decrease fluids so that's false um choice three administer the prescribed medication um not in the transition phase of labor if you do that what do you think is going to happen to the fetus it can decrease that um fetuses um it can depress i should say not decrease but depress their system and so we don't want to give anything that can decrease the system of that neonate that's going to be born soon. Uh, choice four. Where is choice four? Having the client breathe in a uniform pattern. Uniform means the same, the same, the same, the same. How are we going to have them breathe in a uniform pattern? Do you think those contractions are coming in the uniform pattern? No. So their breathing is going to be complex because their breathing is going to be associated with how those contractions are coming. So choice number four is incorrect. The only choice that's correct here, guys, is um, choice number one, where you're helping them maintain control. By the way, guys, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to share my content. I get comments from you all the time of how I've helped you. And I love seeing those comments. I love knowing that I help. But if you're grateful, you're thankful, the best thing you can do besides purchasing my audio lessons on my website, you know, I got to get my plug in nexusnursinginstitute.com. The second best thing you can do is share my content. Please share my content on your social media platforms. Maybe there's someone who's been thinking about going into a nursing program and this might just give them the push. So thank you so much. Thank you in advance for that. All right. Next question. The nurse is caring for a client who is in the taking in phase of the postpartum period. The area of health teaching that the client will be most responsive to is one, perennial care, two, infant feeding, three, infant hygiene, or four, family planning. 
And guys, the correct answer is one, perennial care. So the taking in phase, this is a phase that's right after um, she's given birth. She's done a lot of work. She's tired. For this short time frame, it's all about her taking care of her and her needs, okay? So this is when she's going to be most receptive about to how to care for herself. So this is where you're gonna teach her perennial care because she'll be most receptive about it. Now let's look at the other choices. Two, infant feeding, that's the taking hold phase. Three, infant hygiene, that's the taking hold phase. That's a phase where, you know, okay, so before she was in the taking in, it was about her grandma, mom, husband, staff was taking care of the baby because she's tired. She needs to sleep. She needs to take care of her. But now she's gotten her energy back. Now she wants to take care of the baby. She wants more control of that. That is um, the taking hold phase. She's taking hold of her responsibility and everything she wants to do for the baby. So choice two and um, two and three is the taking hold phase. And then four, planning, um, family planning. Nobody's thinking about family planning at this time, okay? She just had a baby. So she's not thinking about contraceptives, having another baby, all of that stuff. She gonna, she's going to worry about that later. That's not going to be a priority at this time. So the correct answer, guys, is perennial care. Immediately after that postpartum, after she's given birth, the taking in phase is all about her and caring for her and doting for her and just showing her how to take care of herself. A postpartum adolescent mother confides to the nurse that she hopes the baby will be good and sleep through the night. What should the nurse plan to teach the client to do? One, talk softly and cuddle her baby when crying occurs. Two, keep her baby awake for longer periods during the day. Three, ensure sleep by adding cereal to her baby's bedtime bottle. Or four, put a soft and brightly colored toy next to her baby at bedtime. And guys, the correct answer is one. Talk softly and cuddle her baby when crying occurs. This is a brand new newborn. And so you're going to teach her um, how to um, um, console um, this infant. Now let's look at the other choices. Two, keep the baby awake for longer periods during the day. That is not healthy. Do not disrupt this infant's sleeping pattern. This neonate, you do not disrupt their sleeping pattern. And you teach that new mom to sleep when the baby sleeps, but you should not try keeping them up. Um, they need their sleep for growth. Choice three, ensure sleep by adding cereal to the baby's bedtime bottle. That baby's way too young. We don't even introduce cereal to the formula until what? Four to six months. So that's wrong. Then choice four, put a soft and brightly colored toy next to the baby at bedtime. The toy means nothing to the baby. This is a brand new infant. Um, their, their vision is, isn't even that good to see that toy. The toy means nothing to them. What means a lot to them is that affection. So that's why number one is the correct answer. You're going to teach them how to love on that baby and just cuddle that baby and speak to them in very soft, loving tones. The husband of a woman who had her fourth child three weeks ago states that she's been irritable and crying since bringing her newborn home. Home. The nurse tries to assist him in understanding the situation by stating that, one, having four children is tiring and assistance may be needed. Two, his wife probably has postpartum blues and it will soon pass. Three, this behavior is common after birth, after birth and he should not be too concerned. Four, women often express themselves by crying and he should allow her to continue. And guys, the correct answer is one. Having four children is tiring and assistance may be needed. And this is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Guys, I have two. And at least once a week, I want to run away and not come back. So imagine having four. That's the correct answer. Look at the other choices, guys. Two, his wife probably has postpartum blues and it will soon pass. First of all, first postpartum blues occurs earlier and it does not last long. It's been three weeks later. So this may possibly, <coughs> excuse me, be what? Postpartum depression. So this is not something that we should just dismiss. So choice number two is wrong. Three, this behavior is common after birth and he should not be too concerned. Why are you providing false reassurance on something that they may very well be a problem. You're not addressing the problem, so that's false. 
Choice number four, women often express themselves by crying and he should allow her to continue. Oh, so we're stereotyping people now? Women often express themselves by crying and you're dismissing the problem. You're stereotyping, you're dismissing the problem and that is not therapeutic, okay? So the correct answer is number one, saying that having four children is tiring and assistance may be needed. She needs some help. All right, next question. The client with mild preeclampsia is told that she must remain on bed rest at home. The client starts to cry and tells the nurse that she has two small children at home who need her. How should the nurse respond? One, how do you plan to manage with getting child care help? Two, are you worried about how you'll be able to handle this problem? Three, you can get a neighbor to help out and your husband can do the housework in the evening. Four, you can prepare light meals and the, ch and the children can go to the nursery school a few hours each day. There's only one answer here that's correct, guys. Choice number one, how do you plan to manage getting child care help? You're doing a couple things when you do this. Number one, you're asking an open-ended question. So you're allowing them an opportunity to express their feelings, what they're thinking. Number two, in that question, you're letting them know that they're going to need help. Why? They're on bed rest. Look at the other choices. Choice number two, are you worried about how you'll be able to handle this problem? First of all, duh, of course they're worried about it. That's why they're, they bust out crying. That's number one. And number two, this is a close ended question where they just answer yes or no. You're not providing an opportunity for them to express themselves. Look at choice number three. You can get a neighbor to help out and your husband do the housework. How do you know? How do you know they have neighbors that are kind or caring or that they even trust their neighbors? You haven't had a conversation about this yet. You haven't allowed them to express their feelings or what's going on. You can't just assume. Choice number four, you can prepare a light meal. How? This patient is on complete bed rest. How are they going to prepare light meals? That's why they're crying because they have other kids that need them and now they're being told that they have to stay in bed. So that's wrong already. And then let's keep going where it says the children can go to nursery school. How do you know mom can afford nursery school? How do you know she can afford daycare? How do you know she has somebody to even drive them to daycare? You're not gonna know any of this information unless you ask them number one and they start talking. Number one's the correct answer, guys. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. A pregnant client whose first child has Down syndrome is about to undergo an amniocentesis. The client tells the nurse that she doesn't know what she will do if this fetus has the same diagnosis. The client asks the nurse, do you think abortion is the same as killing? How should the nurse respond? One, some people think this is what abortion is. Two, no, I don't think so, but it is your decision to make. Three, I really can't answer that question. Are you ambivalent about abortion? Four, I don't want to answer that question at this time. How do you feel about it? And guys, the most therapeutic response here is three. I really can't answer that question. Are you ambivalent about abortion? So number three, you're not giving your opinion, you're not being judgmental, you're being objective, and you're bringing it back to the patient and asking them how they're feeling about it so they can start talking. Let's look at the wrong choices. One, some people think it, some people think this is what abortion is. That sounds judgmental, that sounds opinionated. We don't do that in nursing. Two, no, I don't think so. It's never about you, it's about the patient. Do not give your opinions. Do not be judgmental. Choice four, I don't want to answer. So you know what you're doing when you're saying that? You're saying, I have my own thoughts about this. I have my opinions, but I'm not going to tell you. I don't want to answer that question at this time. How do you feel about it? That's not therapeutic. But number three, where you're saying, I can't answer that question. Are you ambivalent about abortion? You're bringing it back to them, but you're doing it in what? A therapeutic way. And guys, that's why number three is the correct answer. I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. I got more maternity coming your way. Go ahead, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you thought. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. Uh, during the week, guys, I've been um, 
posting more videos and their lessons their lessons because um i know it's a lot of you guys have been struggling struggling with just content and so i've been delivering that for you so watch out for that but still every sunday 1 p.m eastern standard time i will have a video published where i strictly go over questions i hope you found this video to be helpful please don't forget guys to share my content on your social media platforms thank you so much for watching this video and you'll see me on the next video